Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. My guest today is Professor Claudio Lomnitz, the well-known Mexican anthropologist and scholar. Uh, you teach at Columbia University and of course you've written extensively about uh, the crisis of uh, Mexican state, Mexican nationalism and what you call the dismodernity uh, of Mexico. Uh, Professor Lomnitz, nothing uh, has captured for people around the world the crisis of uh, the Mexican state more than this terrible tragedy that befell 43 uh, students in Iguala in, in Mexico. Uh, they were said to have been kidnapped by a uh, drug cartel after having been arrested by, by the police and then subsequently we were told that they were all killed. Uh, how is such an event even possible? That's a, a good and terrible question. Uh, it, it has to do um, with local uh, inf infiltration of local governments by uh, drug organizations or actually melding of local governments with drug organizations. In the case of Iguala, it turned out that the municipal president, his wife, who was going to be his successor, and uh, most of the municipal offices, including the, the head of the local police force, were all part of uh, the same drug organization that killed uh, the, the students. So there was really no difference. So these are elected officials who also happen to be affiliated to drug cartels? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, what was very troubling about it, among other reasons, is that <clears throat> it's unclear just how many municipal bodies are in a situation like that of Iguala. That is, Iguala is is a city of 120,000 inhabitants, so it's a, a mid-sized city in, in, in a very poor state, the state of Guerrero, and uh, which is, it's in it's the heart of a of an area that is a poppy-growing and heroin-producing uh, region. So, the fact that you had uh, a local government that was controlled by the drug cartel uh, means a lot. And so, essentially, uh, elected officials, local police. Uh, would, yeah. would, would be loyal to the drug cartel rather than the Constitution of Mexico? Uh, in this case, uh, they were part of the, yeah. of the drug cartel. And one of the troubling uh, uh, aspects of the, of the event was that uh, Angeles Pineda, the, the wife of the municipal president, was the daughter and sister of very well-known drug lords who were on the most wanted list of the attorney general's office since before the election of her husband to the municipal presidency. So um, there is some question about uh, whether the whole thing might not have been avoided had either the, the party that, that put them in office, the PRD, or uh, the state government, or the military or the, the federal police had done something about it. And these students were targeted because they were taking on the drug cartel? They were demanding action? No. Um, uh, the reasons are still a little opaque. There are various kinds of versions. The, the main version is that they were, to some degree, kind of killed uh, almost by mistake. Uh, they, they came to Iguala from the school that they, that they studied in, which is in a town called Ayotzinapa. Um, at a time when there was a rally in support of Mrs. Pineda, the wife of the municipal president who was slated to be his successor. Um, a, and uh, apparently they thought that they were going to disrupt the, that meeting and had them you know, sort of kidnapped or stopped right. by the police and then it got out of hand and they killed them all. That's one version. There are other versions uh, amongst the witnesses. Right. Uh, some of them say that there were that they that this was that they feared that the students were part of or infiltrated by a competing drug cartel. Um, so it's a little dodgy to say exactly why, but there were there was no uh, issue really of protesting uh, the infiltration. How deep does this rot go, or how, how high up the political food chain uh, uh, do these connections run? I mean. Uh, President uh, Peña Nieto perhaps initially assumed that this scandal would taint only the PRD, but subsequently uh, it's not been, uh, uh, it's not reflected very well on him either. No, that's right. I mean, I think that what, one of the real miscalculations on the part of the president, for, for the audience here in India, it's worth noting the president of Mexico it belongs to party, the acronym is PRI, PRI. Uh, which was the old official party. Uh, until it was displaced. Until 94? it was displaced yeah, yeah. In, in 2000, 2000 and is yeah. now back in office after right. 12 years. 
um, and the party that was in office in Iguala and also in the state of Guerrero was the PRD, which is the party on the left. And so initially, Peña Nieto really didn't do anything um, because he thought that the PRD was going to take all of the flack for the scandal. But in fact, that's not what happened. Uh, uh, indignation went all the way up to the federal government very quickly, in part because of the the, when they started looking for the 43 students, they came up with uh, mass grave after mass grave that was occupied by people other than the 43 students. So it became obvious to the whole world, and all, certainly to Mexico, that these 43 students were not the first to be killed in this right. region, that there had been a history of, um, of mass slaughter there. And I believe that several, several thousands of people disappeared over the years. They calculate 22,000 right. people disappeared since the start of the drug war, which is 2006. Uh, and then, you know, 70,000 or so people killed during those six years of the, of the drug war from 2006 to 2012. So um, what's coming to the surface now, too, is the extent of that damage and the extent of impunity around that damage. And that is seen to be... Uh, a responsibility of the federal government. So that's one side. And the other side is to do with the army. The presence, the presence of the military in the region is very old because of the drug war, among other things. And the military did not seem to do anything about this, either during the kidnapping of the 43 students or before that. So this has very much touched the federal government, despite the fact that the responsibility over the slaughter itself was really at the local government level. Would it be fair to say that there is ambiguity in the federal government, federal government's attitude, the president's attitude towards uh, the drug cartels? I mean, if, if one argues that uh, neoliberalism, which is the economic doctrine that Mexico now embraces, uh, requires you to uh, keep your hands off business, laissez-faire, is there a laissez-faire attitude towards uh, the narco industry? And <laughs> it, it, does that explain, uh, at least in part, uh, the... Uh, terrible crimes that these cartels are able to get away with. The political economy. It's, of it's, it's hard to, uh, for me to, to respond very clearly to that. I mean, because w w what happened was that the, the president, presidential terms in Mexico are six years, six year terms, and there's no re-election. So the, the prior president, Felipe Calderón, who was from the, president, uh, from the party on the right, um, is the one who declared this war on drugs. And they were, of course, both of those parties, both the PRI and the, and the PAN, that is the center party and the center right party, have both been for neoliberal reforms. But they've had different attitudes toward the drug war. And so uh, the previous president declared this war on drugs, which was, I think, pretty much a, a failure. I mean, what they did was uh, you know, capture or kill a number of drug lords, but the result of that was fragmentation of the gangs and multiplication of gangs, now maybe smaller level, but still uh, very deadly, as the case of this Iguala killings is a lower level drug gang that has been butchering people left and right. Um, so the drug war was, I think, a failure. And the Peña Nieto, our new president's attitude in the beginning, was to try to... Um, toned down the whole issue. That is, uh, so apparently, uh, in part, he, he wanted it to be less in the paper, less associated with the image of Mexico, um, and maybe continue with some of the policies of capturing you know, drug lords here and there. And, uh, but that, that policy, it's, Peña Nieto is only just in, his, the beginning of, in his second year in office, but that policy already failed because of these Ayotzinapa killings, because now there's no way of keeping this out of the papers anymore. And basically, I think the government is, has no real policy. I mean, no, no new policy, no different policy, no, no way of really pressuring the United States into changing its, uh, its policies around criminalization of drugs or legality of the gun trade, which are, both of which are affecting Mexico very deeply. So we don't really have um, a very clear policy. If you look at the, the geography and political economy of uh, the drug cartels and the, and the drug trade, it's clear that it's that part of Mexico which borders the United States that's the worst affected. Uh, you've written about uh, 
Ciudad Juarez, which is the border town, and El Paso, uh, separated by a few miles. Mm -hmm. uh, Ciudad Juarez is a city with the highest death rate in Mexico. Uh, most of the guns used are <laughs> bought in, in El Paso, which is one of the safest cities. Mm -hmm. Drugs produced in Ciudad Juarez, or traffic through Ciudad Juarez, end up in El Paso and elsewhere in the United States. To what extent is Mexico then uh, able to delink itself from what the U.S. is doing in its war against drugs? Or does it require much a change of policy in the United States? Well, in my view, uh, it does require a change of policy in the United States. I mean, it's possible that if they invest a lot more money in, in policing and do things like that, they might be able to, to uh, lower some of, the, uh, some of the killing and mortality around, uh, around this or maybe displace some of the drug trade from Mexico to weaker countries, I mean, that's been happening already. A lot of the drug trade has been going to Central America or to the Caribbean. Uh, there's a lot right now in the uh, Caribbean, the, you know, Jamaica, Venezuela, you know. So it's possible that it's, it, it's just going to shift a little bit out of Mexico into, and into some, someplace else. But in the long term, there's, there's just a, a, a problem with... Uh, with American policy and with the fact that Mexican policy has been no different, um, which is criminalization of drugs. Um, and added to that, I think, uh, in the case of the US, uh, the, the legality of uh, gun sales, which is in Mexico is which not they, Which they extended to the so-called gun walking program where they were actually trafficking weapons into Mexico as part of a <coughs> That's right, complicated yeah. plot to uh, <laughs> get the track. cartels and this backfired very badly. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you had a, a terrible scandal around that. What was it? Fast and Furious right. or something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I mean, basically, the, I think that the situa situation is, what's sad about it is that there's an element that is completely predictable about it. If you have uh, the, the U.S.-Mexican border uh, just to visualize it is you know it's, it's a couple thousand miles long, and it's the border the uh, the international border that has the most intense traffic in the world. I mean, um, the economic traffic of trucks of uh, things going right. through there is huge. The traffic in terms of communication is right. huge, and what happens is any difference that there is between Mexico and the United States is productive on the border. Right. Um, if uh, gas is cheaper on one side than on the other, people That's cross right. the border to get the gas. Right. So uh, because uh, law enforcement in Mexico is not as effective as law enforcement in the U.S. because the Mexican government has always had fewer resources, right. the outsourcing of the criminal thing is in some way predictable. Right. And um, so I don't think you can really deal with it unless you deal with the problem of criminalization. Exactly. Uh, on that point, we'll uh, take a short break. Uh, do keep watching. Uh, when we return, uh, at the end of the break, we will discuss the wider issues uh, uh, surrounding the political economy in Mexico and uh, uh, why Mexico, in some sense, is an outlier uh, when it comes to uh, political trends in the rest of Latin America. Keep watching. Welcome back to IST. My guest today is Professor Claudio Lomnitz. We've been discussing the situation in Mexico. Uh, one question that intrigues many of us in India is uh, why Mexico, despite its revolutionary traditions, despite its size, uh, why has Mexico remained relatively immune from the so-called pink trend in the rest of Latin America? We've seen monumental political changes, of course, in Venezuela, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, uh, Argentina, Brazil. Mexico somehow uh, has resisted that, uh, that swing to the left. Uh, uh, Mr. Lopez Obrador came close to winning the election uh, in 2006. Some believe he was cheated out of it. But by 2012, uh, he was nowhere in the, he was a distant second. Why has Mexico uh, not gone the rest of uh, Latin America's way on this? Well, um, as you say, I think Mexic Mexican politics uh, does have within it some of the same trends as the so-called pink tide. The pink tide that you describe is also itself kind of divided, I would say, within two, mo two modes or modalities. One that is more, um, let's say, strongly populist, uh, represented maybe by Venezuela as the most... Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador yeah. and Bolivia and a little bit Argentina. And the other more kind of social democratic, represented, say, by Brazil or by Chile. A, and Mexico's left had both has both of those tendencies kind of struggling within it, and that 
is part of the issue that the, the left is a little more divided in Mexico than it has been uh, in some of the other countries. Um, uh, the rest is a bit harder to, to say. Uh, I think that the left might have won, as you say, in 2006, uh, and it simply just didn't, and that failure was a very close kind of call. Um, perhaps the attitude of uh, López Obrador, who was the, the candidate of the left and who represents the, the kind of uh, left that is more kind of on the populist side, a little bit closer to sort of Peronism or something like that, um, than the social democratic side, uh, might have cost uh, a, the, 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 the left the chance of, of winning because they were really unable to solve that friction and right now they've created two separate parties so the chance of them yeah. uh, winning you is... You set up this Morena party. Uh, Morena. Mm -hmm. So is this an irrevocable break with the PRD now? I think so and more because of this now with this Iguala uh, killing since the That's Iguala right. killings are uh, directly responsibility of the PRD that was their candidate who, who did this um, I, I don't think that there's going to be any conciliation, uh, reconciliation between them. So although the elections are pretty far off, right. it's 2018, right. um, it, it looks a little, uh, a, a little dodgy. Now also, uh, uh, there are other issues too. I mean, par partly it's, uh, uh, Mexican economy is quite different right now than most of South America's economy. Most, most South American economies were buoyed quite a lot uh, in the last 10, 15 years with the commodities boom. And Mexican economy was not so much, in part because Mexican economy is more manufacturing economy, more con connected but, to the but, U.S. But tied very closely to the U.S. Connected to the U.S. market, whereas a lot of the South American economies became much more connected to the Chinese market during the... So uh, they, they had a, a, a good run, which is right now, uh, you know, uh, a problem because of the slowing of the Chinese economy. But uh, during that time of the, the pink tide, they did have uh, a lot of resources that they could mobilize uh, for changing the social welfare system, et cetera, that Mexico yeah. didn't really have. And now we see Venezuela entering a very difficult zone. That's so right. Venezuela is in a terrible moment yeah. right now. Mexico is also affected by these oil prices. Mexico right. is also an oil producing country. But in the case of Mexico, the oil uh, a is bad, dependency so is, yeah. is much, much less. It affects mainly the government budget. Right. The government is quite oil dependent, right. but the country as a whole is not. Venezuela is 95, 96 percent of its exports are uh, oil, so it's really in a rut. Both in, 20, in 2006 and 2012, uh, López Obrador made fairly serious allegations of influence peddling, mm -hmm. he attacked the television, uh, Televisa. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we now know that details have emerged of cronyism between Televisa and uh, Peña Nieto. Yes. Uh, to what extent were these also factors, or, or are these factors driving uh, political trends in Mexico? Uh, the cronyism uh, and influence peddling. Well, <laughs> cronyism and influence peddling are a major issue right now. And I think that we can expect in the next years, year or two, to have further corruption scandals and further conflict around corruption. Corruption right now has been emerging as a very, very uh, hot political topic in Mexico. Um, the reason why I think we can expect more, uh, more um, issues is in part this HSBC um, That's right. uh, thing where there are uh, 2,000 uh, Mexicans had uh, um, accounts in that Swiss HSBC, probably a few hundreds of them were politicians. So we'll probably be hearing uh, in the next year or two more about tax evasion uh, by politicians or by uh, people in, you know, in the uh, in the wealthy strata in Mexico. So um, I, I would say that the control of Televisa and uh, which is owns about 70% of the television market in Mexico, and then the other good chunk is another uh, chain called uh, TV Azteca, um, that is the, the, those two companies controlling the media like that is a factor, but I don't think it's a determining factor. I, I don't think it, that is so different than what you had in many of the countries where the left did win. Right. That is, if you look at Venezuela, they also had a situation like that. Argentina, right. also a situation like that. Brazil, also a situation like that. So I don't believe that López Obrador's allegations actually account for what happened in the sense that you had 
other places that had pretty much the same or didn't. Uh, that doesn't say, that doesn't mean though that um, the push toward cleaning up and reforming both um, elect election financing in Mexico, which is a whole right. very dirty deal, uh, and uh, the media is not a very hot and burning issue, and I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure on the current government. Uh, there is right now a lot of pressure, and it's hard to say how they'll respond because there is a lot of indication that Peña Nieto himself, as you mentioned, um, has had quite a cozy relationship with Televisa. One of the markers of, of modernity or dismodernity, as you call it, in Mexico was the uh, accession to NAFTA in, in uh, 1994. Twenty years on, uh, do you believe that NAFTA has been a force for good or has it uh, unleashed unstable uh, dynamics in, the, in Mexican society and in, in the Mexican economy? You mentioned dependence on the U.S. Uh, we saw after the financial crisis of 2008-2009, uh, Mexico seriously affected manufacturing, employment. Uh, NAFTA then mixed blessing for, for Mexico or a curse? Well, I think that um, it, 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 it really, to my mind, it's very different to judge it right now than it is to judge it, say, when it happened in, in, in 94 or even a little bit before then, 87, when Mexico entered GATT, that is the, the whole opening of Mexico to uh, uh, well, neoliberal reform from the 1980s. Um, at the time when they did this, I, I, I think that the, the, the force for evil was, was very large in the sense that it involved really um, tremendous uh, ba bankrupting of a lot of the Mexican pre peasantry, much of which emigrated both to the border cities of Mexico and into the United States. So we had a huge emigration uh, caused by the effects of NAFTA on the countryside. Uh, but seen from the vantage point of today, this is 20 years later, um, there are also a lot of good things that emerged from it that I think were paid for very dearly. I mean, some of the, uh, an example of that is uh, the rise of Mexican manufacturing. I mean, today, Mexican, Mexico uh, exports more manufacturers than the rest of Latin America put together, which is, you know, quite an astounding uh, situation. That does have to do with integration with the United States. So I think that what I would say is negative about NAFTA, the d deepest negative, is that the whole thing was done without real, without putting in place the social mechanisms, the, safe, to, safety, nets. the safety nets to protect the people who were going to be most adversely affected. Uh, and that was simply, uh, that, that's simply, I think, a, a social debt, a historical debt that has not even begun to be tallied in Mexico and that deserves serious tallying and that should involve policies for people in Mexico and for Mexicans in the United States who were deeply yeah. affected by this. But 20 years on, I mean, migration from Mexico to U.S. continues at a high rate, maybe now supplanted by uh, migration from the rest of Central America, but even so. Um, well, it is declining. Um, a, a migration from Mexico is declining, among other reasons, because uh, uh, for demographic reasons. This is one of the uh, real uh, issues to do with the image of Mexico versus the reality of Mexico, and particularly in the United States. In the U.S., everybody talks about Mexican migration as if it were going to go on forever, and they build these huge walls and have uh, do a lot of grandstanding. Every politician loves, uh, you know, sort of uh, tearing his hair out on on Mexican migration. But in fact, Mexico has undergone its demographic transition, and right. so actually. Uh, immigration from Mexico to the United States has been uh, decreasing and is expected to d continue decreasing because they don't have any more of the population to export like that. From Central America is a different issue. Right. Uh, and there you are getting tremendous amount and highly exploited uh, uh, immigration, including terribly exploited by the Mexican drug cartels, right. sadly. So the Central Americans are in an extremely vulnerable position. You mentioned the uh, impact of NAFTA on the countryside. We are also now 20 or 21 years uh, after the famous Chiapas uprising with, yeah. when Subcomandante Marcos became mm -hmm. a global figure. Mm -hmm. uh, that movement seems to be uh, at an ebb now. I believe last year they, they uh, announced the formal demise of Subcomandante mm -hmm. Marcos. Mm -hmm. uh, is that the end of the sort of peasant insurgency or peasant movement or is there still, uh, are there still conditions for that sort of movement to uh, restart at some stage? 
That, that's hard for me to say. I mean, I, I think that the, the, the movement has had a lasting um, influence. Um, it has had a lasting influence, certainly at the level of indigenous politics in, in Mexico, throughout Mexico, and in Latin America more broadly. Um, um, but also um, around issues, for example, uh, to do with protection of food production, protection of corn production, and uh, peasant movements. Uh, the current situation that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation in the state of Guerrero, Oaxaca, those are the southern states near Chiapas, which are some of the most indigenous regions of Mexico and also some of the poorest states, highly rural. Um, those areas are right now undergoing something like, uh, at least something that seems a bit like an insurgency. Um, it doesn't, it's not taking the form of the Zapatista rebellion, but you are getting serious rural conflict right now in Mexico. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to wrap it up there, Professor Lomnitz. It's been a real pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. And uh, keep watching uh, Rajya Sabha TV. We'll be back, of course, next week uh, on Indian Standard Time with another guest. Thank you and goodbye.